Hello everyone, welcome to the 0k triple that tournament. I'm your host Dominic and we have a fairly large tournament today for a 3v3 tournament. 10 teams, so 30 people have decided to join up and we are going to be doing a Swiss. I believe it is seven rounds, but I'm not entirely sure. Full disclosure, Shaman's been a little bit off, so I'm not quite... So Swartail is basically taken over. Thank you, Swartail. And at this point, we are going to be... Let's start with something like... Curious if CSM is, but I haven't really seen Fireplug in a while. So let's do Fireplug versus CSM. The the first match that we do for this tournament. So yeah, largely it's going to be round by round, and every round we're going to have a different team being played. And I'll try to get all the teams. Should be able to get all the teams, no problem. So yeah, once we get that all sorted, we have a game, and it's going to be like I said, three three Swiss. It, it's not going to be especially fancy. I mean, this is a bit more of a casualish tournament, so it, it's sort of a fun thing. We'll see what happens, though. I'm really curious how these this is going to turn out, because we don't have a lot of really super powerful teams. The way it was designed, there were supposed to be kind of an elo limit that made it so that the teams were reasonably even, or at least not super lopsided. So I expect this will be not quite that easy to call. But we're going to be getting going. We have the first round, which is actually going to be on a new map, too. Rogue River Beta, which I, I think this might actually be the tournament that's using the Winter Contest map. So there was a mapping contest about... Oh, what was it? I guess about a, two weeks ago. Yeah, about two weeks ago was a mapping contest. And this game, this entire tournament is going to be using those maps for everything. So... Starting out, we have Rogue River Beta, a map which I have not seen before. So most of these maps, I think all of them are going to be completely new to me. I haven't had a chance to really mess around with them too much, so I'm curious to see how this play out. But yeah, at this point, we have, well, as you can clearly see, a very flat map, very watery map. Looks like the water itself is very shallow, so for the most part, that is probably going to be just standard ground units. Nothing too fancy. Is right going for Air Firepluck? So, Team Firepluck, or Team... Okay, Cosmos on the left. Team Firepluck is Firepluck going for Amphbots, Israel going for Air Factory, and FFC going for Rovers. So this is definitely a team I am favoring to win. But on the other hand, we have Cosmo, Zendrovich on tanks, Thargos on Cloakies, and Rapidex? Arpitex? Arpitex. On Amphbots. So I... Oh. Sorry about this one sec. Uh, I was wondering where the music was. The music is not here, because I like to use the default music for tournaments and guests and use my own set of music for everything else. All right. There we go. That's music. So, yeah. we I am I am favoring the East. Yeah, I'm favoring Team Firepluck, just because that is a very strong set of players. I mean, I'm curious to see what Team Cosmo comes up with, and I did want to see this game because I, I wanted to see, like, what what is Team Cosmo? What is this team? The rest of the teams were kind of familiar, but this is new. So, let's see what happens. At this point, we have largely a bit of a scouting force over the south. It looks like Team Firepluck wants to make sure that they have control over the south maxes, which is interesting. We aren't seeing the river being used as a border. We are seeing more of a split, when, not surprisingly, considering the star points were over here and over here. We are seeing a split along the top right, bottom left, rather than from the bottom, rather than through the river. Not sure if that's what was intended by the map maker, but it's certainly going to be the way things play out, because, again, the star points just work that way. It makes it a lot easier to defend the south side for the eastern team than to defend the north side. And vice versa. That, that being said, though, Team Cosmo I mean, they aren't really expanding that much close, that much slower than Team Fireplug. They are managing to take their time a little bit, but at this point, it's just more a problem of what will happen in the mid game because right now, Team Fireplug is very well set up to actually take out anything that gets built over to the south, and aren't really allowing anything to come into the north. Though this Blitz is doing a fine job, should be able to get rid of this conch. That will be a blow, not a, not the biggest blow. I mean, there's three players, so there's a lot of workers that do exist, but still, it's something to have. Team Fireblock getting slightly slowed down by that. The, score, the Scallops will be coming in to try to get rid of this Blitz. And honestly, they should be able to. The Blitz doesn't move. And it doesn't look like, well, the Duck coming in. 
I think one duck shot should be enough. The Swifts have been doing a great job softening up this Blitz. But it did succeed at least getting rid of one expansion. Not the biggest success, considering that it was only one conch and one metal extractor for 300 metal. I wouldn't say it made cost, but hey, it did some damage. So not bad. Not great, but not bad. At the same time, the Team Cosmo is falling considerably behind. They have not expanded anywhere near as quickly as the Team Firepluck. Focus a little bit more on getting that emergency anti here with the ha Hacksaws. Not sure I totally agree, just because Hacksaws are a bit better at getting rid of Ravens. But, eh. Anti here is anti here. It's all pretty useful to have. I'm not going to say that that's a bad thing. Are there any racers being built up here? No, just the one, just the one hacksaw, which is a little bit surprising. But hey, hacksaws happen. I mean, they aren't useless. It's just if you're going to build that, uh, kind of expect to build around the base. But at this point, it's not really going to happen. It looks like primarily we're focusing on Team Cosmo rushing in with all these blitzes. Thunderich insisted on getting those blitzes in there to try to get some raiding going, and I don't really expect that's going to actually accomplish too much at this point. There's enough defenses on board, mostly just enough air defense, air coming in, not even air defense, just air units coming in, destroying everything. Same time, we do have a cloaky raider force looking to go to the north, try to get rid of this crane, which should be able to do that. I mean, there's really no defenses, there's nothing at all prepared for this. There is the phoenix coming down here because, of course, we do have radar over here. The the fact that there is a raiding group coming over to the north is known to Team Firepluck. And I do like the fact that it is a Phoenix. That is going to be able to take care of all these Glaives and the Rockos. Or sorry, the Ronin. I mean, that's pretty much the unit to use here. I... Okay. Did not expect Glaives to ever decide to just sit around fire upon a Phoenix, but there you go. Normally, Phoenix flies too high for that. Oh, and the Glaze running right through the fire. Pro tip from Micro, do back away if your Glaze are ever on fire. Or there's a giant pit of fire that will put your Glaze on fire. Because, yeah, this is kind of why there were no defenses up here. Because there are air units, and it really doesn't matter what happens, because the Team Fireblock can take care of anything that's built up over to the north. So I do expect this is going to be not that easy of a raid. In fact, I don't expect Team Cosmos is going to be able to raid anything. At the same time, though... Team Fireblock is just assaulting the south side of Team Cosmos base. It should be fairly quick now. I mean, after wiping out that raid, we do see seven ducks coming in here. A couple ducks archers coming in from Team Cosmos to try to stop that, but I don't see that actually managing to do much good. I mean, the raid has been destroyed. There's seven glaives, two or three Ronin for two metal extractors. Not really worthwhile. I think the crane actually survived too. Well, no, no, it did not survive. The crane must have died. So, I mean, some damage was dealt, but yeah, it's not really all that great a position for Team Cosmo to be in. They're behind in economy by half, and they don't really have any units to push back on this. I mean, Team Fireblood just expanded like mad, so I don't really see anything that's going to happen that will actually save this. Cosmo is pushing, though. They have sides. They have Glaives. They have or Ronin. They have some options to deal with this. I mean, the size will help a little bit getting rid of the fencers, but it's still just a matter of numbers. And in terms of the numbers, Team Cosmo just does not have them. Certainly trying, but of course, the problem when you're trying to do this, when you're pushing units in over and over, trying to break your opponent's force and breaking yourself against it, you're just going to lose all your units and eventually just die for lack of army. Because, I mean, at this point, Team Fireplug both has an economic advantage and is winning on attrition. By quite a bit, actually. By about 3,000 metal. So I think they might be a little bit cautious trying to make sure they don't throw it away. There's Team Fireplug, I think, they're trying to make sure they don't throw the game away. But I don't think they have to worry about anything. They can just go. As long as they avoid that hacksaw. The, the hacksaw is a problem. But everything else, no. Just, they, they can just rush in there and kill everything. There's really nothing stopping them other than their own sense of caution. And I argue that that sense of caution is a little bit misplaced. But with the Grizzly coming in, that should herald the end. That should herald Team Fireplug deciding to go in and deal the last bit of damage to destroy everything. I mean, it's going to be a little bit hard because of that there is a lot of... Not just anti but just a lot of anti-swarm. A lot of Stardust coming in here, trying to wipe out everything. And that is going to be a bit of an issue. And yes, there is the Etten, there is the anti-air. There are options to help get rid of the bombers coming in. But they still managed to get rid of a commander. So Team Cosmo, they are 
mostly going to be threatened by the fencers. I mean, essentially the anti-air investment, I mean, it's been handy to get rid of a lot of the air units that have been coming out from Israel, but that's not going to be enough to get rid of everything that FFC has gone on the ground for. That is always the thing with the anti-air, is that your anti-air has to deal with the fact that it's fighting against a single type of unit. And your opponents can just change what type of units. It's all, it's all a balancing act of how many you get of each type. But when you're behind economically, it's very difficult to actually manage that balancing act, considering that as it stands, you're already not really able to buy enough units for either type, let alone for either type, like air or, or ground, let alone being able to fight both. Cosmo, though, is fighting valiantly. I mean, this is a tournament. This is a Swiss tournament, so it's not like they're being eliminated. If they die here, they are going to be... Or if they lose here, rather, they are going to be moving on to round two, of course. It's just they don't get the point. Team Fireplug will get the point. Team Cosmo looks like they are... They're going for it. I mean, the resign votes up. Thargos definitely is done. Yeah, that is it. Team Cosmo throws in the towel. And Team Fireplug takes it with a very convincing... What the heck? Anyway, Team Fireplug takes it with a very convincing economic and army lead the entire game. So yeah, we know who Team Cosmo is. Might have been a little more lopsided than I hyped it up at the beginning. Okay, so I mentioned before, someone in Twitch chat, Ophelius, is asking me, what do I think of the GBC team and the FX team? And I, the thing is, is that if you actually check the rules, the team, okay, I mentioned the team LO or Wilt rating, whatever, being below a certain value, that actually got repealed. If you look at the tournament post, you'll see that there's actually an edit to avoid bothering with the rule, because the rule just got too confusing. So... Yeah, right now that rule actually doesn't exist. It existed at first when the teams were initially created, but so the teams might... I, I brought that up because the teams might be affected by the fact that that was at one point a rule, but it's no longer a rule, so yeah, it's a little confusing that way. Also, if anyone's watching and is doing the tournament... Actually, I'm going to put in the tournament... I want to have the tournament games say that they're tournament games. Like, otherwise, I've got to... It's more than when I'm checking the replays afterwards, when I'm... Which, admittedly, I haven't been as keen... As good about... But anyway, let's let's jump over to GBC and Spark, which I think will be a more even game. I mean, it's been going on for six minutes and actually hasn't been over as far as I can tell. But yeah, same map, so I hope you like this map, which currently the only opinion in Twitch chat is no, but I mean, it's here. It's the first round map. I'm really kind of curious about all the winner contest maps because I haven't had a chance to look at them too much. So I know it sounds sloppy, I have good reasons I hurt myself. It's getting better, don't worry, but I did hurt myself a week ago working out, and it, yeah, have to be careful. Anyway, you're on to game. And we have, okay, team, not sure what, yeah, team Spark, I guess was called for the East team. So now to go on, basically the same thing, Air, Cloaky, and, oh, Air, Cloaky, and Hovercraft. Doing a lot of damage to deal, deal, deal with the north side of the map, too, and it looks like it's going to be largely a fight over the north side of the map. The south side of the map's been relatively secured and not really all that much going on, but the north and center, that's where everything's going on. It looks like, looks like the eastern team, looks like Team Sparkles, ha or Team Spark, I'm going to double check what it was, because... Spark for Manu. Okay, cool. Team Spark for Manu is definitely having a bit of an easier time here. I mean, like I said, they secured the south side of the map, the north side of the map is being under heavy assault by them, so that should work out pretty well once that gets all sorted. And other than that, air control is the only thing that really in contest, but no, it's, that's going to be done. Manu 12 taking air control, no problem. So yeah, right now I'm not so concerned about the whole GBC versus Manu team or whatever, because we're seeing them fight each other, and that's a fairly even match. Although at this point, Spark for Manu is... They're taking on the north side, so they're going to get a pretty nice economic advantage from here. 
Right now, though, the attrition being in their favor, I'd say, is a much bigger advantage. The fact that they have an economic advantage, that is helping Spark for Manu, but it isn't the be-all, end-all. The be-all, end-all is the fact that they're taking that economic advantage on top of a stronger, larger, more, at least more costly army. And, of course, much more secure to the south side. Though, with the fencers coming in, this might not be so secure. I mean, the pickets won't be causing any problems. The glaives coming in here for... Four sparkles should be able to take out the rest of this, but I'm not really entirely confident because, well, it's. I mean, it is just a bunch of glazing, a bunch of fencers. It kind of comes down to how they get in here, and it looks like they will be able to spread out enough. I mean, again, do spread your units out, please. I don't know why sparkles never line moves. It honestly bugs me. But, yeah, do spread your units out. It makes things a lot easier. And. Yeah, so with with that nice defense over to the north side of the map, as team Man for Spark, or Spark for Manu managed to take out the south side as well, they've got a very solid lead here. 20 metal per second going in, and that is going to be... That's going to be what it is. I mean, this is kind of a tricky situation. All right, probably also... What map? What is the name of this map again? Rogue's River Beta. Okay. All right, so it's, I mean, at this point, kind of a stalemate a little bit. I mean, it's clear that, like I said, the Team Spark Commando has an advantage. They aren't really pushing it too much. A lot of the advantage right now is coming from the fact that they've got this Reclaim right here, which is doing a great job for them. But the question, of course, now is how is that Reclaim going to actually make itself useful? Because it's not just a matter of having Reclaim, it's a matter of having Reclaim that then turns into units that then actually do enough damage. And right now, GBC has managed to kind of pull their way back in from attrition perspective. Like, there was about a 2,000 metal, or 3,000 metal disadvantage. Now it's gone down to about 2,000, actually closer to 1,000. So GBC is catching up. And with Thunderbird coming in here, we could see this entire army get wiped out thanks to Thunderbird. I'm not sure why the Raven is over here trying to help deal with this stuff, but yeah, Thunderbird... Can help get rid of this. Anarchist Commander getting rid of a lot of the daggers, which moved a little carelessly. And at the same time, though, GBC is still trying to take out that south side of the map and still not managing to really do all that much damage. Not managing to lose a lot either, though. They're being relatively safe. Not pushing the fencers out too far, just keeping them in a relatively safe position so they can hold a bit of a fort. I noticed that not a lot of the teams have decided to really build up... Well, okay, I should say... GBC hasn't really decided to build up the south side too much. It's clear that team Spark for Manu really wants this north side. They're building all the defenses. They're making sure that nothing can easily get in. So definitely much more important for Spark for Manu to make sure that they actually have their side of the river entirely to themselves. While GBC, on the other hand, trying to just go for big pushes. Not really trying to set up fire bases beforehand. Just going for the pushes, going for as many units as possible, get them in, and use that to break their opponent. Which, I mean, isn't a bad strategy, all things considered. It's just a little bit... A little bit iffy for the simple reason that it's one of those strategies that requires you actually get all those units to do the damage and not die. Otherwise, they've got nowhere to retreat to. And if they have nowhere to retreat to, they're more likely to stay in the middle of the fight and get themselves destroyed, leading to even worse attrition. But at the same time, this is actually a really nice situation. Enough fencers to at least force Sparkles to retreat. But again, Sparkles has a bunch of defenses to retreat to. Sparkles has their commander to retreat to. And of course, they can start rebuilding more stuff and repair everything they have. So Sparkles has something to retreat to, where, at this point, Wesley have a picket. That's about it. But it's not even near as much. At the same time, though, Anarchid is much more keen on having proper fire bases and proper defenses. So this is going to be considerably different and considerably harder to assault. However, I do expect that with switch over, well, not so much the switch over to gunships, but rather just the push on air and the fact that there's not a lot of anti-air in this north base, we should probably see once this flail is destroyed. A lot more damage coming in from the skies for the team Spark for Manor to get rid of the GBC North Base. Same time, Hokumoko going for an Ampot Factory. It took 10 minutes, but Hokumoko goes for that Ampot Factory, as they usually do. Uh, granted, they haven't really plopped Ampot in a while, as far as I can tell. It, it's, it was their thing, it's not really their thing anymore, but it's always nice to bring that up. And we have an Iris! Yes, thank you! I brought this up last week during the Exhibition Match cast. Irises have become a thing people use all the time and for good reason they are really strong i mean they cloak your units i mean for ronin it's not a huge deal because ronin they have a lot of range but for things like 
knights and reavers especially irises are amazing i kind of wish that sparkles was a little bit more attentive to that because this iris was not quite in the right position it is actually managing to bait in a lot of the units though that is working okay unfortunately this stinger is not invisible so it's not like it's going to be that de well defended but at the same time these glaives able to come out here and just generally completely nullify their advantage range of the fencers on top of the gunships coming in here bit of a save for manu 12 but still that is going to be that's gonna be spark for man to mention and maintain this base over to the south without really losing much of anything and actually managing to push in further unfortunately they didn't didn't bring the iris along with the rest of the army which i i can kind of understand because you don't necessarily want to lose the army but still same time bit of assault over the north side of the map but not really accomplishing much few maces coming in here from anarchid but they aren't really finding too much value at the same time there is a grizzly coming in here from hokomoko off that ampot factory but the question is what is there to deal with that a lot of scalpels have been built up so it's possible for spark commander to have options here they are going for a crow as well which i mean okay that's a thing are they aware that this exists no in fact their radar is not super great right now they aren't really where they are. They are where their stuff there, but they haven't seen it. So, no awareness of the Ambot Factory. There's no awareness of the Grizzly. I don't expect we'd see anything super anti-heavy to get rid of it. I mean, considering what they have so far, I would expect we'd probably see either a Thunderbird to help stun it out, or possibly, possibly a bunch of Gnats to get rid of the Grizzly. People in some of the YouTube comments in the previous videos were pointing out that ultimatums would be a great option, and I agree, but people don't usually build ultimatums, so I don't expect that to happen. Also, why are they going for a Singularity Reactor? That better be low priority. No, it's mid-priority. That's that's 20 metal per second going to a solar uh, to a Singularity Reactor. That's not going to be a thing. That's not going to happen. I'm sorry. It's like Singularity Reactors don't really happen in 3v3 that often. I mean, they can. But with 100 metal per second, that's still a little low to make a singularity reactor actually work out. Especially when you consider that the attrition has actually kind of gone in GBC's advantage. And GBC is on the north side, and the Grizzlies coming over with the maces. And while there are a lot of scalpels to help get rid of it, and they will do a pretty good job of that, it's still not great. Like, let's be honest, right now, all that money is going into that crow. I mean, it's 40-ish metal per second going into the crow, which... I mean, it's not everything. There's still the other half of metal going over to these scalpels. So, the Grizzly is forced retreat. The scalpels are doing a nice job, but the maces are able to get close enough to the scalpels. It doesn't even matter. That's the thing with Hovercraft. The whole Raider, Riot, Skirmisher triangle is a little bit lopsided because of the way that maces are. They just have the slightly longer range. It makes it a little bit harder for the Skirmishers to actually outrange them and deal with them. Harder than you might expect. I mean, at the same time, that's the only damage being done. In the south side of the map, there's... There is a massive build of forces from Sparkles to help get rid of everything that Wesley's built up. So, really, it's kind of coming down to what happens with this defense over here. And it looks like the defense is still going to be successful, but considerably more Pyrrhic than it looked at first. I mean, the scalpels are being wiped out one by one, and this entire section up here is... Like, everything up here is very vulnerable. The maces could just go up there and destroy all of it. There is nothing stopping them other than time and the fact that the scalpels are on, back on their way. But, yeah, some damage could be dealt over here almost a why not situation just take out everything over here and that's nice damage same time though that crow oh that crow's almost done six seconds away from being done same time the singularity reactor is not being okay that that makes sense <laughs> they have they have enough power 316 energy right now they're good same time there's the crow coming in here which well i guess we're the halberds at least a little bit of a a little bit of overkill on that D gun, but I mean, it does get rid of the halberds without them having an armor, even though the halberds are returning fire, so it's not that hard to bait them out into fighting. But yeah, at this point, really, it's just a matter of the fact that there was an economic advantage for Team Spark Command, and that's the main thing pushing them. Okay, I'm done with this. That's the main thing that's pushing them forward right now. But at the same time, we are going to be seeing. I mean, the scalpel's coming in here. There's the lance coming in. That's the biggest thing to me. The lance is coming in here. That's basically telling the Grizzlies, no, you go away. And then the Crow, of course, also telling the Grizzlies, no, you go away, to an extent. I don't think it's the most effective thing here, just because of the fact that it is a single target, and there's a lot of anti-air, and the Grizzlies are really good at destroying single targets. Just, you know, this one beam, it's, yeah, it's pretty good at hitting one target, or a bunch of them together. They're going to hit one target multiple times and destroy it. On the other hand, that goes for the lance, too. 
And more importantly, the south side of the map is basically getting taken over. Sparkle's coming in with this giant cloaky force and not a whole lot to deal with them. Most of the nor most of the GBC forces have been used to help push over to the north side of the map. Most of the money has gone into Grizzlies. And while a lot of the money for the team Spark for Manu has gone into that one crow, that was only 40 metal per second out of 100 at the time. So there was still plenty of metal going into Cloakies. There was still plenty of metal going into Hovers. And the, just the money, probably 20 metal per second going into the Cloakies, has clearly been more than enough to wipe out this entire vehicle force. The Ravagers have no chance against the Glaives. The Glaives just wipe out everything over the base. Should be able to take out Wesley's entire base, honestly. There probably will be some units pulling back, but I don't see any Phoenixes. There are a few Ravens. But those aren't going to do a huge amount of work against the Glaives. The Scorchers are definitely helping out, though. That actually is being quite effective, but there's still a giant group of Reavers, Ronin, and some Phantoms on top of that, really helping out in the back. So the Glaives won't quite be able to destroy the base. The, Spar the Scorchers did do enough to defend that. But, sheesh, the amount of army damage coming in here, allowing for this follow-up afterwards of the Knights, the Reavers, the Ronin, and the Phantoms to just destroy everything that's left of Wesley's base. Looks like they might be forcing a bit of a desperation attack over to the north side of the map because GBC realizes they've kind of lost the south side completely. But if they can take the north side, they can kind of get a bit of a map. They can rotate the map a little bit, just kind of split it north-south. Which, that could be a winning strategy going forward, but I don't really know how that's supposed to work considering that the East team still, or the Spark for Mana team still has an economic advantage, still has a bit of an attrition advantage, still has a lot of really heavy units, and I'm pretty sure still has the... No, they lost the Lance. They lost the Lance! Really? Oh. They really lose the Lance? Yeah, I don't see it on... Yep, no, yep. Lance is gone. Okay, well, bit of a shame, that. But they still do have the Crow. And they still have the capacity to make a new Lance, should they so choose. And they got a lot of Reclaim going, too. So, yeah, they could definitely afford it. I mean, considering that GBC has just lost his entire south side of the map, they don't really have much access to the, to the reclaim here either. They are trying to get rid of the commander, though. Sparks' is commander under a great deal of threat. These units cannot get back in time. The commander has to run. The knight will be the one thing trying to defend it, but no, there's way too many Scorchers. This commander is going down. We'll jump away. We'll try. Oh, never mind. Stardust. Oh, perfectly timed Stardust. Never mind. The commander saved by its Stardust. The two workers died in the process, but that Stardust... That is a hero Stardust right there. That saved, well, saved Sparkle's commander. I mean, it didn't really save the game. At this point, it's still an advantage for Spark Commander. I don't think we would have done it. Killing the Crow is going to be far more effective, actually. I don't know Lance has come in, but the Crow has gone down. More inside of Spark Commander's base, though, so the Reclaim will be able to go in to Manu, or to Sparkle's, whoever actually grabs it. But still, that is... That's a bit of a blow, but the Lances are up. The Grizzlies aren't really able to get in either, and... At the same time, there is still an even stronger firebase position to push in. I mean, basically, Sparkle has taken the south side of the map completely. I just them has taken the south side of the map. It's, that's it. That's all there is. Sparkle's coming in, wiping everything out. I mean, Manu is coming in with a bit of support to help out push, but really, Sparkle has this. They have got a, how much reclaim do they even have here? Got like three thousand metal to reclaim on top of everything else they've already got over to the north again, thanks to the Grizzlies and the Crow. Yeah, this this is the end of Wesley's base. Hey, is that? No, that's never mind. I was gonna say, is that? That's not Spark Commando team reclaiming. No, no, that's GBC reclaiming their own stuff. Make sure they have it when they still have it. But I think this is gonna be it for Wesley. I mean, this is gonna be for Wesley. I'm not sure this is gonna be it for the rest of the team. But Wesley doesn't want to play anymore. They've lost their base. I'm not sure what the rest of the team figures they can win because at this point, any time they're trying to apply pressure over to the north side, it's just not working. I mean, there is this pressure over here, the actual attack over the north I mentioned before, because of the fact that it's hard to defend for, for Spark for Manu, but it's just not going to be enough. I think that's the last commander going down, too. Hokumoko losing their commander while Wesley loses their, loses their base, and really not much is coming in to try to contest this. GBC down to 40 metal per second compared to about 100, so I don't expect this to go any way differently. I mean, I'm kind of here... I'm kind of seeing it. Yeah, GBC throws in the towel. That is going to be Spark for Mana taking a point. Now, what team? Team based. And as you can see, like it actually was pretty close. For the most part, army value was fairly close between the two. Metal use, however, that's the kicker. Metal economy was definitely advantage to Team Spark for Manu. Actually, value killed was fairly even too. So when you consider that all together, yeah, it's it is ultimately going to be advantage to Spark for Manu. I think. 
the fact that they pushed for the crow was a little bit of a gamble, but it did work out reasonably well. And normally, I've mentioned before, like people go for heavy units and then it doesn't work out, but at that point, both sides are going for heavy units, so that's generally a more safe time to do that. Because if both teams are going for heavy units, you don't have to worry as so much about being swarmed by a bunch of light units that are going to destroy the one heavy unit you make. You're going to be fighting heavies on heavies, and it's going to be a little bit more even. So yeah, that was that. I think this is going to be... This is going to be the last game for round one? Hard to say. It looks like it might be... Now let's look at the other games. I'll double check. I think this is... I think this is if for round one. We do have... So you can see here, we do have most of the results coming in. So that should... Oops. Oops. Crap. That should determine it. That's what... One, uh, yes. Looks like... Okay, Team Malric decided to throw it in. Oh, DoD actually won against Team... Fa really? Wow, who's... Who's Team Failer? That seems like a pretty good team. That would be... Oh, that was one of the three players. Okay, probably Yale, Failer, along with Monero and Astran, I'm guessing. Alright, so I'm curious. It looks like we do have one more game that's ongoing, but it probably is going to be... On... Or is that... How's this working? So DoD did beat Flail. I was specifically requested to cast DoD, actually. So, and I mean, I, I always try to cast everything. I don't think I'm going to cast him next round, though. I think next round I'm going to be probably going in for Dyth made us do this. I meant to see that last time, and I didn't. So, check into that. Wait, do we have fail? Oh. Alright, so it looks like GBC and 400. Wait. Hang on, this bracket isn't right. What? Okay, there we go. That's why I was confused, because I actually had a slightly off bracket. Alright, so we had. Wait, we're starting over? I'm so confused. What is going on here? Okay, we have... Okay, we have a slight issue. We're going to be waiting for round two. So, we'll have round two up in just a moment. There's a bit of a technical difficulty with the brackets. So, yeah, I think Sortel tried to update it to make it so that it worked, but it didn't really work. I think tried to reduce the teams, but then it ended up remaking the brackets. So we'll just have to wait for Sortel to sort that out. Anyway, we'll be back in a couple seconds, so stay tuned.